Karis, Guardians of Hades Romance Series, Book Number Seven, written by Felicity Heaton, narrated by Eric G. Dove. Chapter 15. On a scale of weird to straight up freaking out there, today was fast becoming the latter. Not only was Karis sitting on the cream couch facing the large flat screen TV with Enyo beside him, both of them looking as if they had been together for years, and there was nothing odd about any of it, not even the fact his older brother was watching the damn television. But Cal had just popped out of his portal behind Ares and casually tossed something out there that Ares was having a difficult time processing. He twisted on the couch to face Cal where he stood in the middle of the room, between the TV area and the dining side. I'm sorry, what now? Ares frowned at his little brother and if this was a joke, he was going to tear the little shit to pieces. Beside him, Megan broadcasted nerves so strongly that Ares was in danger of losing his temper. You getting hard of hearing in your old age? Cal glared right back at him. I said, Mom and Dad want to see you, Megan and Karis. Now like. Emphasis on the now. Like, now. Imagine me booming it like only Dad can do. So whispering it. Valen muttered without taking his eyes off the TV. You guys do something bad I don't know about? If the answer is yes, why wasn't I invited? Kara sighed. Valen got the message and fell silent. This isn't a funny joke, Cal. Ares growled as Megan's rubbing grew more frantic. So frantic that Cassandra's cat Milos thought she was summoning him and went to her, hopping up onto her lap and giving her an expectant look. Or maybe the guardian deity was just sensing her unease. Panic. Ares said it like it was. It was fucking blind, balls-out panic. He stroked her knee through her jeans. It's okay, sweetheart. Don't shoot the messenger. But please, do go, because Dad had that look in his eyes, and I don't want to be held accountable for you all refusing to obey the summons. Cal held his hands up and tossed Ares a pleading look. Were his eyes blue at least? Diamond eased into a more comfortable position where he leaned against the wide footrest beside Cassandra's legs. Would it kill us to get another couch? Escher muttered something about the aesthetic and having to replace all the couches so they matched. Shut up about the fucking furniture. The leash on Ares' temper snapped. Maybe Megan wasn't the only one panicking. She rubbed his leg now, her touch doing nothing to calm his nerves. Why would Dad want to see us now? Ares looked from Megan to Karis. Karis pursed his lips. I can guess why Father wishes to see me. I would imagine the reason he wants to see you is because summoning Megan without you would cause a ruckus. Although he appears to have caused a ruckus by including you. His older brother waggled a finger towards Megan's stomach. My best guess is Mother wants to see how she's doing. Which made sense, and made Ares feel like an overreacting dick. He sank into the couch beside her, all of the tension rushing from him, leaving him boneless. He raised his hand and pinched the bridge of his nose, rubbed it, and tried to ease the headache he could feel building. This was all getting to be too much for him. When Megan had announced she was pregnant, he had been over the moon, more excited than she had been. The closer they came to her due date, the more that excitement turned to chilling fear. He couldn't sleep for thinking about what might happen to her, and not only when the time came and she had to give birth. He worried about her constantly, was on his guard at all times, waiting for an attack to hit them, dreading her being in the firing line, and convinced she was going to end up in the sights of their enemy. He felt sure that he hadn't slept since he had woken from his gate-closing-induced coma. Every day that passed, the tension inside him cranked a little tighter, pushing him a little closer to the edge. He wasn't sure he could handle this anymore. He was beginning to see why his father had become an overbearing, overprotective demon whenever his mother had been close to giving birth to one of his brothers. The slightest thing had sent Hades off the deep end, like really slight. One time, Merrick had belched after dinner and startled their mother. He had been banished to the North Wing for ten days, only released back into the family once Valen had come kicking and screaming into the world. Karis stood and gave him a look that said they were doing this. Ares blew out his breath and stood too, gently took hold of Megan's hand and helped her onto her feet. 
Panic lit her beautiful face. I should change, put on something nicer, and do my hair, and maybe put on some makeup. He smiled softly and stroked his thumb over the back of her hand. You look great as you are, but maybe we should lose this. She scowled when he picked a piece of potato chip off her mulberry flowing top. It's not my fault she likes junk food. I'm blaming you for those jeans. He shrugged. Come on, beautiful. He tugged her forwards, leading her around the couch, his heart drumming faster as he approached Cal, and thought about taking Megan with him to the underworld, to his parents. Gods, they had better be nice to her. One word out of place and he was liable to erupt. Karis came up beside her, a serious edge to his green eyes that told Ares he wasn't alone in his need to protect Megan. All will be well, Karis said, and held his hand out to Megan. She slipped her free one into it, took a deep breath, and nodded. A shimmering blue portal formed in front of them, Callistos's favor mark at work. It'll take you to the palace, Cal said. Ares stepped forwards and stopped when Megan didn't move. He glanced at her. She stared at the portal, fear building in her eyes, trickling into him through his hand. He squeezed hers lightly. Nothing bad will happen, sweetheart. Mum will be there. He murmured softly, trying to soothe her, aware that it wasn't the underworld or his mother that she was afraid of. It was his father. Just need a minute, and then I'll be peachy. She glanced at him, her dark eyes filled with worry. Ares feathered his fingers along her jaw and brushed her shoulder-length brown hair behind her ear, clearing it from her face. Take all the time you need. He lingered with his palm against her jaw, staring down into her eyes, putting every fleck of gold in them to memory as a need rose within him, the darker side of his blood coming to the fore to roar at him to protect her. He intended to do just that. She blew out her breath again and nodded, and this time when he and Karis moved forwards, she came with them. She tipped her chin up as they stepped into the portal, squeezed his hand so hard it actually hurt as light swirled around them, and didn't loosen her hold as they emerged on the other side. Rather than appearing outside the sprawling complex, the portal brought them to one of the elegant drawing rooms. Hades turned away from the window that overlooked the garden, his blue gaze settling straight on Megan. Ares breathed a sigh of relief. At least his father had chosen a more calming location than his imposing throne room, and wasn't wearing his armor. A black tunic hugged his torso, and matching trousers were like a second skin on his legs, tucked into knee-high riding boots with silver clasps. Persephone immediately rose from her seat on one of the lavish, gilt-framed crimson couches and crossed the room to Megan, sweeping her up into a tight embrace that had Ares growling. Gentle! His mother pulled back, issuing him a look that asked him whether he had really just dared to give her an order when it came to being careful. Fine, so the phrase bull in a china shop had probably been invented for him, but this was Megan they were talking about. With her, he was a lamb, as gentle as a kitten. Gods, she had him wrapped around her little finger. And he loved it, just as much as he loved her. Satisfied? he said, not keeping the bite from his voice as he looked at his father. Hades arched an eyebrow at him, one that screamed temper. Ares imagined Karis was giving him the same look. Persephone moved to him next, hugging Karis tightly, holding him for so long Ares began to wonder if she was ever going to let him go. Let me look at you. She finally pushed Karis back and looked him over. Oh, you do look better. Tears filled her eyes. My love. Hades reached for her, a wounded look crossing his face, as if her pain was his to share. Or maybe he just wanted to take it away for her. Persephone didn't go to him. She gave him an uncharacteristic hard look, a mulish twist to her lips, and Hades' hand fell to his side. Ares was familiar with the expression that settled on his father's face, wore it quite often himself, wrapped around her little finger, and in the doghouse. His mother moved back to Megan and fussed over her. When she placed her hand on Megan's bump, her green eyes lit up. Oh, how she kicks. She is strong, my love. She cut herself off, and the soft look she had been about to give Hades turned into a glare. Mother, Kara started. It really was my decision. Not yours entirely. 
He gave you the pills, and he said nothing to me about them. Persephone issued another withering look at Hades. His father's shoulders sagged. Ares had definitely been there. Women scorned, eh? He said, and Megan rolled her eyes at him. He fell silent as he stared at her, finding it strange but weirdly right to see her in this room, in this realm. She belonged here. He felt that deep in his bones. She was stronger here, and would grow stronger the more time she spent in this world. The dark circles that had been beneath her eyes were already fading, and she had more color, and gods, it felt good to see her brighter again. It felt good knowing she was safe and protected, and that nothing could touch her. And we shall transform the unused wing of the house into a nursery for you and your mother. Persephone bent over and spoke to Megan's belly, her soft tone bright and filled with the excitement that was written all over her face. Hades looked as if he wanted to say something but was biting his tongue. Ares could imagine what it was. Megan and the baby didn't need an entire wing to themselves. Megan wouldn't enjoy it. She liked being close to others, in the thick of things, surrounded by her family and friends. Which is what made this so damned hard. Ares released her hand. Megan's eyes instantly leaped to meet his. Panic washed over them, her expression stricken as she twisted away from Persephone and reached her hand out to him. Ares wanted to take it, but he couldn't. Karis's gaze drilled into him as Ares backed off a step, placing more distance between them. He didn't look at his brother, couldn't take his eyes off Megan as tears filled them. and filled hers. She shook her head, sent them tumbling down her cheeks, tried to lunge for him, but his mother took one look at him and seized hold of her shoulders, keeping her in place. Megan jerked backwards, trying to dislodge Persephone. She clutched her belly and she shook her head again, sending more tears chasing down to her jaw. He swallowed to dislodge the lump in his throat and husked, his voice tight as tears choked him. Keep her safe. No! Megan tried to break free of his mother, managed it this time. She hurried to him and his heart broke when she gripped his arms, when he felt the panic mounting in her. I don't want to stay here. Her eyes darted between his, the tears that filled them ripping at him, tearing down his strength. Don't make me stay here. Her brow furrowed as she looked up at him, as her belly pressed against him and she held his arms. I don't want to be away from you. I can't do this without you. Ares wavered, steeled himself as he blinked and cleared his vision, sending hot tears down his cheeks. He slid his hand around her nape and pressed his forehead to hers, wished with all his heart that he could do as she wanted. But he couldn't. I need to know you're safe, he croaked and clutched her to him. Sweetheart, this kills me too. She shook her head and dug her fingertips into his arms, desperately clinging to him. I'm a healer. You need me. Don't do this. Please don't do this. Don't leave me. He cursed the tears as they flowed down his cheeks. Couldn't stop them no matter what he tried. He dipped his head and kissed her long and slow, savoring the feel of her lips against his as she kissed him back, as she clung to him. When it became too much, he tore himself away from her. Megan stared at him, the pain in her eyes calling to him, making him want to give in and let her have her way because he hated seeing her cry. He hated hurting her. Persephone came forwards and gently took hold of her shoulders. He stepped forwards again and placed his hand on Megan's belly, smiled as she placed hers over it and looked up at him, a flicker of understanding dancing among the pain in her dark eyes. She hated that he was doing this, was going to be angry with him for a while, but when she calmed down, she would understand why he'd had to do it and she would know how much it had hurt him as well as her. He felt as if he was ripping his own heart out of his chest as he looked into her eyes, severing a vital part of himself by leaving her here. I love you both, he whispered. Won't be long. Words he had said to her countless times whenever he'd had to leave her over the last couple of months, as her pregnancy had progressed and the need to protect her and remain with her had grown stronger. He waited, desperate for her to respond as she always did, to show him that she understood and to give him the strength he needed to do this, and something to keep him going while they were apart. She broke free of Persephone, tiptoed and grasped his nape. I love you too, she breathed against his lips, 
and kissed him. A kiss he would never forget. Full of hurt, full of hope, full of love. And a plea to come back to her. He swore that he would. He stepped back from her. Are you really going to do this? Karis murmured. Ares nodded but didn't have the strength to leave. Karis took the decision out of his hands, gripped his wrist, and pulled him into the portal. The moment it closed behind him and he felt the connection between him and the underworld sever, he sank to his knees on the tatami mats. What's wrong? Escher rose from the couch and hurried towards him, the rest of his brothers and their women doing the same. Ares stared at the mats, unable to muster his voice as his heart ached, as the need to force Cal to open another portal tore through him. He lifted his hand and swiped the back of it across his cheek, sniffled like a damned girl as he thought about Megan, as that need to return to her pounded inside him. Megan? Escher's gaze darted from him to Karis. Did something happen? Ares drew down a deep, shuddering breath, aware that he needed to answer his brother because if he didn't, Escher was liable to believe something bad had happened to her and the baby, and he would go off the deep end again. No, Karis said for him his tone soft, calming. Ares decided it was best Megan remain in the underworld with mother and father. I just want her safe, Ares croaked. He just wanted her at his side, but he couldn't let her remain in this world where she was in danger, and he couldn't remain in the underworld with her. He had a duty to do. His brothers needed him in this fight. Karis placed a hand on his shoulder, and it was weird that he could do that now could touch him without fear of Ares' fire burning him thanks to the spell Cass had woven into the bracelet he wore with his limiters. That spell gave him control over his fire, made it easier for him to keep it in check in this world, although that control still slipped from time to time. He looked up at his brother, his aching heart warming as he saw the concern in Karis's green eyes, and the need to support him, to be there for him. Ares nodded, silently thanking his brother. He needed all the strength he could get right now, and was grateful that Karis had helped him with the hardest part of leaving Megan. He was grateful to all his brothers and their women as they gathered around him. Merrick helped him back onto his feet, and Iko wrapped him in a tight hug that had Escher growling at him. Diamond came to him and gripped his shoulder, offered a smile that said he was there for him. I can probably put together a spell that would allow you to see each other although I would need to enter the underworld to set it up on that side too, like a magic mirror. Cassandra's words were a balm to his heart, the thought of being able to see Megan whenever he needed to, soothing some of the hurt. She'd like that, he husked, struggling to deny another wave of tears. I can cast a portal so you can visit her, Cal said. Ares nodded. I'd like that, but I don't want you tapping yourself out. Using his favor mark to create a portal was draining for Cal, and he needed his brother strong, didn't want to be responsible for anything that might happen to him because he had weakened himself by casting portals for him to visit Megan. Cal shrugged, lifting the hem of his black t-shirt. Whenever you want one, you've got one, okay? He nodded again, noticed that Enyo had remained at a distance, near the end of one of the couches, and looked unsure what to do. Megan had filled him in on what had happened when she had come around, and he couldn't deny that he hadn't been happy about what Enyo had done, or her timing. But as he looked at Karis, he could see a glimmer of the man he had been back in the underworld, so he wouldn't hold it against her. Karis's gaze shifted to the goddess, a light entering his green eyes, warmth that Ares hadn't seen in a long time, not since they had left the underworld. It felt good to see his brother happy again. Now he just wished the two of them would quit dancing around shit and get together. Maybe he could help a little there, could bring Enyo into the insanity that was his ever-growing family and make her feel at home, and give his brothers a reason to stop ragging on her about what she had done. Enyo! Ares jerked his chin, beckoning her. It probably wasn't wise to treat her like someone who should obey his commands, but he was too tired to go to her, didn't trust his legs right now. Her jade eyes widened. She looked as if she wanted to point at herself to check it really was her that he was asking to come to him. He arched an eyebrow at her. She moved forwards, hesitantly at first, casting wary looks at his brothers. Ares could only imagine how they had treated her while Karis had been away. 
one of them must have said something because it wasn't like the goddess to be this sheepish. He had seen her kick Karis's arse on numerous occasions in the underworld. His brothers were no match for her. It dawned on him that she was holding back around them because she wanted them to accept her. Well, that only made him want to do this even more. When she reached him, he kept his focus on her, shutting out his brothers. I have a favor to ask. He ran a hand around the back of his neck. And I don't want to hear a no from you. Her black eyebrows met hard. Issuing me an order, Ares? He shrugged. More like a request, but one that might appear to be an order if you don't look at it from the right angle. She folded her arms across her chest. I am listening. There was that haughty, take-no-prisoners female he had known growing up, the one who had smacked Karis around in the training ring more times than he could count, had laid him out flat half of those times, and had sent him home with a sparkle in his eyes and a grin plastered to his face every time, something Ares had always found disturbing. Spending the evening with a grinning Karis always felt wrong, especially when his brother hadn't seemed able to wipe it off his face. His brother had been one somber bastard before meeting Enyo, and had returned to being that way after they had come to the mortal world. He glanced at Karis and caught a familiar twinkle in his green eyes as he watched Enyo, although it seemed Karis was slowly turning back into that grinning idiot again. Ares couldn't blame him. Sometimes he found himself grinning from ear to ear too, smiling as he watched Megan, feeling lost in her and how much he loved her, and how blessed he was to have her. He knew that when the baby came, the number of times he found himself smiling like a crazy person would only quadruple. And he wanted that. He wanted to be able to smile and not worry, which was why he needed to ask Enyo for this. My favor involves your favor. And God's, a lot rested on her granting it. He felt that deep in his soul. I want you to bestow it upon my kid. You're strong, capable, and brave and no one can fight like you do. And I want to know she'll be like you. I need to know she'll have your protection. Her eyes widened again, a hint of rose climbing her cheeks. You really want that? He nodded. You have no idea how badly I want it. A little girl. Shit. I need to know she'll be safe, able to handle whatever life throws at her. He had watched her train Karis. She had been dedicated and thorough, and he knew in his heart that she would take even greater pains in teaching his daughter how to fight, how to protect herself from anyone who meant her harm. Enyo held her hand out to him. It would be an honor. She smiled, one that lit up her eyes and wobbled a little, telling him how much this meant to her. Her brother had held her back for far too long. It was about time she got to shine, was treated like the powerful goddess she was not forced to walk in her brother's shadow as he stole all the glory. Ares took her hand. Might hire you as her personal trainer, too. Don't think Dad knows squat about training girls. The ground shook beneath his feet. He wouldn't take that one back, no matter how many earthquakes his father caused. Hades wanted to treat girls like they were precious and delicate, shielding them from the darker side of the world. Ares wanted his daughter to be strong a warrior in her own right. He wanted to know that no male would dare mess with her. He also wanted her to never date, but that was something he would be discussing with her the second boys went from gross to great, which gave him plenty of time to get Hephaestus to forge an unbreakable chastity belt in her size. Deal, Enyo said, her smile growing wider. Anyone so much as looks at her in the wrong way, they will have to deal with me. Ares grinned as relief swept through him, lifting some of the weight from his shoulders, and couldn't wait to tell Megan that he had secured them the best damn godmother the world had ever known. No one was going to mess with their daughter. Ah, and since no one has said it yet and my older brother still seems incapable of putting feelings into words, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. He shook her hand. Welcome to the family. Chapter 16 Karis forced himself to let what Ares said slide, partly because his brother had just put himself through an ordeal that Karis could feel was still hurting him, and in part because he didn't want to let his emotions master him, even when they wanted to. He tamped down the urges that flooded him, 
battling the hunger to lash out at his brother, for not only daring to insinuate that he couldn't control his feelings, but also for the fact he had implied that Karis felt something for Enyo. Something deep enough that he wanted her to join their family. Which he did, but it wasn't his brother's place to tell her that. Enyo slipped her hand from Ares and glanced at Karis, a blush scalding her cheeks, one that tugged at him, had him aching with a need to go to her and gather her into his arms, and kiss her. She was no dainty maiden, didn't need anyone's protection. But gods, she looked sweet and innocent, a delicate beauty whenever she blushed like that. Blushed for him. He couldn't remember her ever blushing for another male, not in all the years he had known her. With everyone else, she was the goddess of war. With him, she was the woman locked beneath that armor she wore to protect herself. The urge to usher her out into the garden so he could finally tell her how he felt was strong, a pressing and demanding need that made it hard to think, hard to focus on anything else. It took all of his will to keep his mind on the task at hand, something that would give Ares the distraction he needed and might bring the final battle he could feel brewing forward, alleviating the tension that was building inside not only him, but all of his brothers and their women. He was growing impatient, tired of waiting. He needed to kick this battle off, and not only because it made strategic sense to force the enemy's hand right now, not giving them time to build their forces up any more. He needed some action, a good brawl to help him unleash the pent-up energy that was steadily growing inside him and to help him focus on other things, things that were not black, oval, and numbing. Just thinking about his pills had his stomach cramping, his mind racing to think of every place where he might have stashed some as a backup. Someone touched his hand. He blinked and lifted his gaze. It collided with Enyo's. She smiled softly. Back with us? He shook his head and then nodded, and her smile widened. Which is it? Yes or no? Yes. He ruthlessly shoved thoughts of pills out of his mind, focused on Enyo and her gentle touch, using her as the shield to protect him from the ravenous hunger that gripped him. Not for food, but for the chilling numbness, the freedom from his feelings. Feelings were a positive thing to have. He told himself that on repeat as he twisted the silver band on his thumb around it the warm feel of the metal soothing him together with doing this simple action. His thoughts fell into order again, heads slowly clearing and the urges fading again. You're getting better at that, Ares said, and Karis glanced at him for an explanation. Pulling back from the brink. It struck him that he was. Since Enyo had taken matters into her own hands, he had experienced countless moments when the need for a pill had grown too strong had almost overwhelmed him and sent him into a silent battle against his addiction and the voices that goaded him, that tried to make him believe that it didn't matter if his family disowned him, or if Enyo turned her back on him. The pills were all he needed. The battle to resist that inner voice was steadily growing easier to win, and for the first time in a long time, he felt more in control. He felt stronger, better about himself. Enyo didn't release his hand. She toyed with his fingers, giving him something to focus on as he faced his brothers, helping him keep that voice at bay. We should close another gate, he said. As predicted, his brothers erupted. No, not a chance in hell, Ares snapped and looked at the others. Diamond shook his head and Valen scowled at Karis. You crazy? Cal barked, his eyes stormy, verging on gray rather than blue. The only gates left are Hong Kong and Tokyo. He's right. We cannot risk condensing the power spread between the two down into one gate, Merrick put in. I could close Hong Kong, Escher murmured, earning himself a few glares and a black look from Diamond. That is not going to happen. Diamond gripped Escher's shoulder, hesitantly at first, but tighter once he clearly remembered he could touch without hurting anyone, now thanks to the bracelets Cassandra had made for him and Ares. The black gloves he couldn't bring himself to take off blended with Escher's black shirt. Escher's blue eyes brightened dangerously. I can do it. No, I will close Tokyo. Those words leaving Karis's lips had everyone gaping at him as if he had lost his mind. Ares' hand clamped down on his shoulder, and it was still strange that Ares could touch him again. It felt like old times. Really felt like it when Ares spoke. 
I'm sorry, but that's not going to happen. Karis couldn't remember the last time someone had dared to deny an order he had issued. It hadn't happened since they had left the underworld, that was for sure. He pulled together a convincing argument, attempting to make it watertight so Ares couldn't argue against it. I could close Hong Kong, Escher repeated. Karis shook his head, and he wasn't the only one. He didn't want to send his brother off the deep end, not again. It was too risky. There was no way of telling which Escher would wake from the deep sleep closing a gate would put him in. If it was his other side that took the reins, there was a chance that he might go on a rampage, hunting for the enemy and lashing out at anyone who tried to get through to him. Escher had killed hundreds of their father's soldiers when he had swept through the underworld hunting for the wraith. If Escher flipped in this world, he would slaughter a hundred times that number, the presence of so many humans bound to trigger a violent response in him. Iko came to Escher and wrapped her arm around his right one, holding it tightly as she slipped her hand into his. He looked down at her, his brow furrowing, sorrow washing across his noble features as his blue eyes sought hers. I can do this. I'm strong enough now. We want to draw the enemy out and force them to act and I'm stronger than Karis right now. Which was a bit of a kick in the balls. Karis couldn't recall the last time he had been viewed as the weakest member of the team. In fact, he was sure it had never happened before. If the Hong Kong gate is unstable because of Escher's current condition, then Tokyo is just as unstable. Diamond looked from Escher to Karis, and then at each of his brothers in turn. We can't place all the strain on Tokyo right now. He has a point. Merrick scratched the light dusting of stubble that coated his jaw, a thoughtful edge to his earthy eyes. It might be exactly what the enemy wants. Karis considered that, calculated all the angles, and frowned when he realized that his brothers were right. His current condition was no doubt affecting the gate, and closing Hong Kong could very well make the Tokyo Gate unstable enough that he would no longer be able to control it. We have to do something, he bit out shocked by the sharp edge to his tone and the burning need that swept through him on the heels of those words escaping him. He didn't try to hold it back, just let it flood him and then rush out of him. This inaction is driving me crazy. I need to fight. Enyo squeezed his hand, drawing his focus to her. Concern shone in her pale green eyes, and he shook his head, silently asking her not to side against him too. Rather than doing that, she surprised him by saying, I can spa with you. If you need some release, you can find it that way. Release? Is that what the old folks call doing the dirty? Valen nudged Cal and winked at him. Cal grinned and then frowned. Damn it, I had something funny there on the tip of my tongue and it's gone. Ah, crap. Something about sparring and swords and sheaths and things. Karis growled, enough. Cal immediately clammed up. Valen had the audacity to poke his tongue out which only made things worse. Enyo stared at his brother's tongue. What is that? Valen ran the metal stud in the center of his tongue across his upper teeth. Pure titanium thrills, baby. Ask Karis to get one. You'll thank me for it. Ava loves it. Squirms like a crazy thing when... Stronzo, Ava muttered as she shoved him in the side of his head, causing his neon violet hair to fall down over the other side of his face. He swept it back and frowned at her. A puzzled look flitted across Enyo's face. How does it make her squirm? Oh, gods, Ares grumbled and palmed his face. Karis grimaced, might have blushed. He cleared his throat. But words failed him and Valen jumped on the opening. When a man and a woman love each other very much, the birds and the bees get all frisky-like and... He jerked forwards and scowled at Ava again his eyes narrowing on her raised hand where it lingered near the side of his head. You're going over my knee, missy. She squealed as he grabbed her, swept her up into his arms, and kissed her. She sank into it, a moan escaping her as all of the fight left her. Karis's blush might have deepened. Enyo made sure it did when she looked at him, all innocence. I still do not understand. Does he mean squirming as she is now when he is kissing her? There is a sort of kissing involved, Diamond murmured under his breath. Enyo canted her head and frowned, her puzzled look bordering on adorable now. Karis would have thought it that, had the topic that was confusing her not been so damned embarrassing. Ask Karis to show you, 
Escher mumbled into his palm. Karis sighed. He expected this sort of behavior from Valen and perhaps Callistos. He expected better from the rest of his brothers. Ah, lay off them. Ares collared Escher in diamond and kicked Valen in the back of his knee. It crumpled beneath him, sending him and Ava crashing to the floor. Valen gave Ares a disgruntled look. I still wish to know what Enyo started. It's a sexual thing, Karis blurted, regretted it when her wide eyes landed on him. He had hoped it would make things better, but everything felt a million times worse as she stared at him in silence, unblinking, that pretty blush on her cheeks darkening towards crimson. His body got the wrong idea, twisted the thought of sparring with her to let off steam into a wicked scenario in his head, one that would turn fighting into something far more pleasurable, something he had been without for centuries. His experience of carnal matters before meeting Enyo had been limited, and after that he had only thought of her, had only been interested in her. He hadn't kissed a woman, hadn't touched a woman, hadn't wanted another woman since the moment she had walked into his life rocking his entire world off its axis. His brothers fell deathly quiet. He tossed Ares a pleading look, asking for a lifeline, something to get him out of this mess. Ares released Escher and Diamond. I could blow off some steam myself. What if we lured the enemy out? No closing gates, just some good old-fashioned baiting. Cal muttered to Mirinda. My two oldest brothers are suddenly acting reckless. I feel like I've fallen into an alternate reality. Am I meant to be one of the sensible ones now? Cass leaped on that one, her Russian accent adding bite to her words. I am not sure you are capable of that feat. Diamond whispered, Burn. Cal glared at both of them. This sort of banter felt strangely good to Karis. He had never participated in it, had always been on the outside of it looking in, but he had always enjoyed the way his brothers would tease each other in the underworld. He had enjoyed it far less after they had been banished to this world, and he had been forced to accept the responsibility of ensuring they survived and they succeeded in completing their mission. He wanted to participate, to show his brothers that he could be one of the group too, that he had retained a sense of humor. Only he couldn't think of anything to say. We could draw the enemy to Hong Kong. Escher glanced at Diamond, clearly wanting his input. The two of them had always been close, shared a bond that had made Karis jealous a few times. I could go along with that. Diamond's pale blue eyes gained a serious edge as he added, But we're not closing the gate. Karis nodded. Agreed. Both gates should remain open. As much as I do not want to admit it, I am not at my strongest right now. Ares came back to him and lightly tapped his arm, the sort of playful punch his brother had often done back in the underworld. Their mother had always smiled whenever Ares had given him a love tap, as she had called it. It was his brother's way of showing support, and it always made Karis feel as if he wasn't alone, as if he did have a deep bond with at least one of his brothers, as if one of them understood him and the weight he carried on his shoulders. What if we add a little more incentive for the enemy? Cass swept her long black hair over her shoulder her aquamarine eyes bright with mischief, that had Diamond sighing before she even announced her plan. I should go with you. No doubt the enemy knows you both well, and would expect Diamond to go with Escher, and in turn they would expect me to go with Diamond to support him. So you don't need to go, Diamond glowered at her. If they're expecting you to be there on the basis that I'll go with Escher, then you don't need to go. She pouted, evidently displeased about the flaw in her plan. I agree. This is not a good idea. Merrick looked at Marinda and Callistos. Marinda shook her head, her blue-green eyes edged with violet as her power rose, curling around Karis. The enemy wants to get their hands on you, Cass. What happens if they manage that? Cass went to her and pulled her into a hug. I swear, I will be safe, sweetie. No. Marinda yanked free of her. If you go, then I'm going too. Cal reached for Marinda's arm. Hey now, let's not all go crazy. The enemy wants you too. Let Cass go. Cass shot him daggers. You want me to get witch-napped? He pulled an innocent face. Me? Never. Whatever made you think that? Colorful light bathed her palms and the strange scent of magic filled the air. Ares inserted himself between them and grumbled, Now, now, kids. I do not think it is a wise idea. 
Karis looked from Cass to Diamond. My brother is right about that. The enemy wants your ability to raise the dead. We cannot afford to give them any opportunity to get their hands on you. Cass turned her glare on him. So you think you can just binge me? The glow of magic coming from her hands grew brighter. Enyo stepped between him and the witch. Try it, and we shall see how well you can cast your little spells when you are buried six feet under. I doubt necromancy could bring you back from the sort of death I would deal. For a heartbeat, Cass looked as if she might take Enyo up on a brawl, and Karis swore the entire room was holding their breath as they waited to see what she would do. Karis held his breath because the thought of watching Enyo go all out was strangely alluring. Had those damned wicked images filling his head again? He subtly placed his hands into the pockets of his black trousers, trying to conceal the effect they had on him. He wasn't sure he had ever been so hard. Cass pulled a face as she shrugged, and the light in her palms faded as a smile slowly worked its way onto her lips. I like this goddess. She has balls. The sorceress looked over her bare shoulder at Diamond. We should bring her to the gate, too. Enyo shook her head. The enemy seemed rather inclined to flee when they saw me in Tokyo. A shame. Cass hiked her shoulders again. I would like to see you fight. Karis wanted to see it again, too. He shook that thought away and clawed together the tattered remains of his focus. Diamond and Escher will go, and I will go with them together with Ares. Enyo looked as if she wanted to voice an objection. I am going, too. Cass held her hand up, her palm facing Diamond and Marinda. I will be safe. Milos came to her, purring loudly as he twined himself around her legs. She looked down at him and cooed sweetly. I know you will be there to protect me if I need you, my adorable baby boy. The ginger and white tomcat meowed and then glared at Diamond. Karis could practically read the guardian deity's mind. He had met a few in his years, but he had never seen one that was so fiercely possessive of its master. The cat had shown him time and time again that he didn't like Diamond stealing her attention away from him. You're not coming. Diamond shook his head when she scowled at him. Be mad at me all you want. I don't want you playing bait to lure the enemy out. Escher went rigid. She doesn't have to play bait. His blue eyes leaped to meet Karis's and verged on black. The Hong Kong gate is opening. Chapter 17 Karis stepped the moment Escher announced that the Hong Kong gate was opening. Darkness embracing him and the cool touch of the underworld giving him strength as he prepared himself. The scent of dew and earth greeted him on the other side of his teleport, and he hunkered down in the shadowy night, peering across the rolling landscape of Lantau Island to where the gate was located. Escher had been right. Violet light glowed on the next hill, a spot that was growing brighter as he stared at it, willing his senses to sharpen. Escher and Diamond appeared right in the middle of the group of demons who were forming a barrier around the gate. Damn it. Karis stepped again because so much forgetting the lay of the land before leaping into the fray. His brothers were going to need him. The demons weren't the only ones at the gate. Meadow, the fury belonging to the enemy and half-sister of Marinda, was there too. She stood with her hand outstretched, palm facing the central disk of the gate as it slowly expanded confirming his suspicion that she had managed to get her hands on either his or one of his brother's blood during a previous battle, and it was still potent enough for her to siphon the power to open the gate from it. Her golden hair flowed around her shoulders as she lifted her other hand to hold both before her. It caressed skin turned milk white by the slender moonlight, a contrast to her black corset and leathers that blended with the night. Karis landed near to her and immediately focused on the gate. She bit out a curse as it began to close, turned a glare on him. That glare became a look of concern as Enyo appeared close to him. Gods, it felt good to have her at his back. He wasn't a fool. He knew he was in no condition to fight, that he wasn't at peak strength, and it would be easy for the enemy to get the better of him, not because he was physically weak, but because he was mentally weak right now. The darkness already writhed inside him, rising to steal control of him, and he couldn't surrender to it, was bone-deep aware of the destruction he would cause if it overtook him, but he wasn't sure he was strong enough to hold back the tide. 
He slid a look at Enyo, silently asking her to do whatever it took to protect his brothers and this world from him if the darker side of him won. She nodded and stroked her right hand over her left hip, her fingers caressing her black leather trousers. A blade materialized in her grip as she did so, as if she was drawing it from an invisible sheath. He wished he had come armed with his own sword. Normally, he fought with his shadows, using his power against the enemy. But doing so now was dangerous, would only provoke the darker side of his blood. For fuck's sake, Diamond bit out, snagging his attention. Cassandra stood just a few feet from him as he fought a wave of demons. His brother drove them back from her and summoned a wall of ice between her and the enemy. I told you to stay put, he growled as he swiftly raised his arm and five sharp shards of glittering ice shot up from the hill, impaling two demons while the other three managed to evade the attack. Go back. Her pale blue eyes widened and she threw her hands forwards, and turquoise light burst from her palms. A shimmering blue barrier swept across the air between Diamond and an enormous demon. The huge blade the male had swung at Diamond clanged harmlessly off the barrier, and the demon grunted and stumbled backwards, losing his grip on the weapon and clutching his arm. Diamond blinked and looked at Cass. I take it back. You can stay. Because if it hadn't been for her barrier, the demon would have skewered his brother. Two more males lumbered forwards, coming to flank the one who had struck at Diamond. Karis's senses lit up. These demons were old, powerful, one of the rarer breeds. They grew before his eyes, grunting and snarling, snapping fangs at each other as obsidian horns curled from their foreheads and huge onyx leathery wings ripped through their t-shirts. Their nails blackened and elongated, transforming into razor-sharp talons. Their eyes glowed crimson. I have this, Cassandra announced, voice dripping confidence that Kara seriously doubted, until she smirked and tipped her head up and continued. I have faced this kind before. I saved Callistos and Mirinda from ones like them in London. They are no match for me. She shifted her arms to her sides, closed her eyes, and mouthed words as Diamond built another wall of ice, this time between him, Escher, and Cassandra, and the three demonic males. Violet light spiraled down her arms to her palms, and she grimaced as she hurled it at the demons. The males didn't even attempt to evade the spell. The reason became apparent when it struck them. Glyphs shimmered over their bodies, etched into their skin. Someone had made the Fury some powerful bodyguards. Oh, shh! Cass ducked and Diamond grabbed her, stepping with her as a double-bladed axe cut through the air where she had been. The demonic brute grunted and swung again aiming at Escher instead. Escher stood his ground, lifting his hand and curling his fingers into a fist. Karis waited for the demon to go down as Escher used his power over water to stop the male's heart. Only he didn't. Escher's black eyebrows rose, a look of disbelief crossing his face in the split second before he teleported too. Diamond reappeared with Cassandra beside Karis. This is bad, Diamond muttered. Karis was inclined to agree. Enyo stepped forwards. They are just three little demons. I can handle them. Karis was not inclined to agree with that. He grabbed her arm as she lifted her sword and readied herself, his heart lurching painfully at the thought of her attempting to battle these demons alone. We do this together. He held her gaze as she glanced over her shoulder at him, kept their eyes locked until he was sure that she was listening to him and wasn't going to attempt to battle the demons alone. Together they were strong enough to handle these males. At least, he hoped they were. He shifted his gaze to them and studied them. Wards protected not only their skin, but their entire bodies. The enemy didn't have that kind of power at their disposal, and he had never heard of using wards on someone like this before. He frowned as it hit him. Because they weren't wards. They were a spell. Magic. Karis looked at Cass as Escher appeared beside her and he and Diamond leaped into action, tackling the wave of weaker demons that surged towards them. We need to reach the Fury. Karis glanced at the blonde where she was still working to open the gate, a wall of demons between them. The gate was slow to respond to her, which gave him hope. Whoever's blood she had in her possession, the power in it had faded enough that the Fury would have to exert all of her will to convince the gate to open. He focused on it again, undoing her hard work, and she loosed a frustrated scream. His gaze darted to Cass. But something tells me that's going to be harder than it sounds. 
this is witchcraft, isn't it? Cass nodded, drew down a breath, and closed her eyes as she held her right hand out. A twisting orb of violet and green light blasted from her palm, shooting over the heads of the demons, heading straight for the Fury, who didn't even bother to move. The spell collided with a barrier close to fifteen feet from her, and a wave of blue light rippled outwards. Someone knows my tricks. Cass scowled at the barrier as the light chasing over the dome slowly faded, but made it far enough to reveal the size of it. It seems they have found themselves a witch. Does she need to be nearby to keep this barrier up? Karis had learned that Cassandra had to be close to any barrier she cast in order to keep shoring it up, but he wasn't sure whether that was because all barriers required that sort of care or because of the type of spell Cass used required it. Cass nodded, her blue eyes scouring the darkness. She's here somewhere. Find her. Karis fixed his sights on the fury as the central disk of the gate finally finished forming and flashed brightly. And if you could break that barrier somehow, it would be greatly appreciated. Doing both might be a bit much, even for me. She flicked him a look. In this case, violence solves everything. Hit that barrier with all you have and it will crack. Something Karis didn't want to risk. Hitting the barrier with all he had meant going all out, and he wasn't strong enough to handle that right now. Enyo cut down a demon who strayed too close to him. I could hit it with all I have. She could, but Enyo's power was brute strength. She would have to be close to the barrier in order to strike it. Karis didn't want her among the demons. She might have been born a goddess of war, might be skilled and competent, capable of taking care of herself, but that didn't mean he had to like the thought of her fighting. I'll go with you, he said. She nodded and then smiled, the shadows that had been crossing her delicate features lifting like a cloud had parted to allow sunlight to shine through. It will be like old times. He couldn't hold back his own smile as he realized why she looked so happy all of a sudden. It will. It had been too long since they had fought at each other's side. He launched into the fray with her, using his shadows to trap and devour any demon who got too close to her, and finishing off one she had cut down with her sword as she carved a graceful path through the throng. One of the demonic brutes turned his sights on her, crimson eyes flashing fire as he shoved the smaller demons aside. The male picked up pace, and Karis moved to intercept, calling on his shadows at the same time. He grinned as the black tendrils shot towards the male and growled as the glyphs inscribed on his body shone and repelled his shadows. Not good. Enyo twisted and slashed, and unleashed a frustrated growl of her own when her blade bounced off his skin. It didn't even leave a mark. She ducked and rolled as the male swung a huge sword at her, narrowly avoiding it. It sliced through several unfortunate demons, decapitating one and injuring the others. Karis grabbed them with his shadows as Enyo sprang to her feet and hurled the wretches at the male as he made a lunge for her. The demon grunted as his comrades hit him, knocking him back a step and blocking his path to Enyo. Karis stepped and placed himself between her and the male as she battled another group of weaker demons. The demonic male grunted, bared fangs, and spread his wings. Karis braced himself as wind battered him, mustering his shadows, waiting for the male to strike. Purple-white lightning shot down from the cloudless sky, and Karis's eyes widened as it struck the male. Karis twisted and hurled himself at Enyo, grabbed her and stepped just as a bolt ricocheted off the male's skin and shot towards her. He landed with her in a clearing, breathing hard as he struggled to calm the darker side of his blood as it snarled for revenge, to seek out and punish the one who had come close to harming her. Valen. Ah, fuck, his brother grumbled in the distance. That's not fair. Karis's heart thundered, the darkness rising even as he tried to push it back down. Enyo framed his face with her palms and angled his head up, so his eyes locked with hers. All is well. I am safe. Karis cursed in his head as he looked at her, as it struck him that he was no better than Escher, was afflicted in the same way. There were two sides to him, and the worst one came out whenever the one he loved was in danger, shot to the fore and tore down the better side of him pushing him towards a mindless rage state. Enyo hammered it home by continuing to whisper soft words, the same kind Diamond had been forced to use on Escher countless times, to help him hold back the darkness. I am fine. I will be fine. 
He nodded, sucked down a breath, and exhaled it, waging a war of his own as the battle raged around them. Fireballs sent waves of demons flying, filling the air with the disgusting scent of singed flesh, and ice impaled those who survived the inferno, finishing them off and spilling their vile black blood. Lightning struck again, splattering the world with bits of bone and entrails, and rain hammered down to wash it away. Valen, Karis barked. Target the fury. Hit that barrier with all you have. Valen stopped with his hand wrapped around the throat of a female demon, looked across at him and nodded. He tossed the demon aside and lightning forked, blazing a path directly for her. She didn't even get a chance to scream as it struck her. The next bolt his brother summoned hit the barrier, causing arcs of purple to chase across the blue dome as it shimmered. Valen hit it again, and again. Ares worked to protect Valen, giving any demon who dared to turn their sights on their brother a fiery death. Karis pulled down one final breath and straightened as he felt back in control, as he relied on his brothers to do the fighting while he orchestrated their attack. Valen and Ares continued to work as a team, decimating the demons and the barrier. Diamond and Escher were shielding Cass, using walls of ice and Escher's power over water to devastating effect. Around them, demons were dropping like flies. Good, but bad. Karis kept a wary eye on Escher, because his brother was weakening. Using his power to control blood and stop hearts drained Escher, and it wouldn't be long before he wouldn't be strong enough to keep fighting if he allowed his brother to keep going at his current pace. Karis worked his way towards them with Enyo's help, lashing out with his shadows and trying to ignore how good it felt as they burrowed into the demons who blocked their path draining them of their energy and killing them, trying and failing. Pleasure rippled through him as his shadows tore at the demons, as carnage surrounded him, and he sensed more demons arriving, more for him to kill, to slaughter, bathing his hands in black blood. The thought of that had heat washing through him, turned his head foggy as a desire to surrender to that need chased through him, building into a compelling urge that had him veering off course heading for the two powerful demonic males who were trying to reach Cassandra. Enyo moved into his path. She shook her head. Do not. The desire to ignore her was strong, and so was the urge to shove her aside and growl at her for daring to block his way and think she could control him, ordering him around. He curled his fingers into fists and pulled back on those needs, refusing to let either get the better of him. She was right. Engaging the demonic males was futile. As long as the spells that protected them were in place, there was nothing he could do to stop them. It would be a bloodbath, but it would be his blood bathing the battlefield. The consequences of bleeding were too dangerous, had him clawing back control and playing it safe, even when he wanted to hurl himself into the fight. He glanced at his brothers, seeing in the strained lines etched on their faces that he wasn't the only one having to hold himself back. They all wanted to be out there in the thick of it, fighting with fist and blade at close quarters. But it only took a drop of blood. If the Fury could get her hands on their blood, she would find it easier to open the gate. And not only that, she would have their powers at her disposal for a short time. Even a short time in control of his shadows could prove devastating to this world. To his brothers, he had no doubt she would turn them against his family, against him, against Enyo. He couldn't bear the thought of that, so he eased back a step, showing Enyo that he wouldn't engage the males unless it was absolutely necessary. A bright wall of shimmering blue appeared to his right, blocking the axe of one of those demons. The male's crimson eyes narrowed on him and he bared fangs and flapped his wings, hunger etched on his rough features. Karis bared fangs right back at him. I found her, Cass said, and his gaze whipped to her. She disappeared in a wink of crimson light, and Diamond stepped a split second later, a scowl on his face. Escher snarled and dropped his right hand. A wall of water fell on the demons, crowding the space between him and the Fury, sweeping them off their feet and sending them tumbling into the other demons. Ares took advantage of that, unleashing a huge wave of fire at the wretches. Steam billowed as it seared them, as their cries shattered the night and heat rolled over Karis. Valen launched another assault on the barrier, and this time Karis joined him, attacking it with his shadows as Enyo battled five demons, driving them back. He focused on the barrier, 
unbreaking it so they could reach the Fury. Another ring on the gate emerged, and he split his focus between attacking the barrier and commanding the gate to close. Meadow twisted to face him, her eyes bright violet as they narrowed on him. She said something, and the demonic males turned their sights on him. Enyo didn't want him to fight them, and he didn't want to risk engaging them either, but it looked as if he wasn't going to get a choice. They shoved the demons, blocking their paths aside, picking up speed. I think I can do this. Escher didn't sound confident. His brother drew down a breath and held his hand out. It shook, trembling violently as Escher closed his eyes. Karis waited, shifted his feet shoulder-width apart and flexed his fingers, ready to take on the demons if Escher couldn't bring them down. Only it wasn't the demonic brutes that his brother targeted. Meadow gasped, her mouth opening wide as she clutched at her chest, as she fisted her hand against it. The gate stopped resisting Karis, suddenly lurched into action and began to close. He cast a glance at Escher. Sweat dotted his brow, sticking his black hair to it as he leaned forwards, as his head drooped. All three demonic males turned as one towards his brother, launched at him on mighty roars. Chapter 18 Karis raised his hand and a wave of shadows erupted from the grassy hilltop, rolling towards Escher as his arm dropped and he staggered backwards. The writhing black tendrils swept around him, encasing him as the three demonic brutes reached him. To his right, the gate began to open again, the fury recovering swiftly now that Escher was no longer working his own brand of black magic on her, attempting to slow her blood and stop her heart. Enyo leaped into the fray her silver blade a bright arc as it slashed through the darkness, driving the three males back. Her sword clashed with the one the largest of the males wielded, and she slammed her hand against the flat of her blade, shoved forwards with it to force him back, away from Escher. Everything dark in Karis roared at him to protect her, and he had to force himself to focus on shielding Escher while he was weak, keeping the two other demons at bay as Enyo dealt with the third. That demon was swift to use his wings, spread them and beat them hard, blasting her with wind as he increased the space between them. She weathered the storm and lashed out with her blade anyway. The tip of it grazed the male's stomach, cut through the remains of his t-shirt, but not through his flesh. They needed to destroy the spells that were protecting these males. Another ring formed on the gate, rainbow colors chasing around it as it grew and glyphs filled it. They really needed to destroy the spells or at least the barrier. Ares. He didn't take his eyes off the battle between Enyo and the trio of males. Cut me a path. No way. Ares cut me a path. Valen's voice rang out above the shrieks as heat rolled over the battlefield again in a bright blinding burst of orange light. I can do this. That barrier is about to go down. Before Karis could protest, Ares sent a barrage of fireballs at the demons. They curved a path through the remaining males and females, struck the barrier, and exploded, engulfing the dome, but thankfully not breaking through it. The last thing they needed was the gate being struck by any of their powers. If it took damage, they would be forced to close it. Another ring formed. A charge built in the air, raising the fine hairs on the back of Karis's neck and his arms. Valen clicked his fingers. A blinding blaze of lightning shot down white and purple bolts that spiraled together into one thick, jagged stream. Valen was out of his mind. Before he could turn on his brother and tell him that and make him redirect it, it struck the barrier. A deafening boom rocked the earth as the lightning connected with it, sent everyone to the ground and had Karis's ears ringing before the shockwave hit him. His senses jumbled, vision spinning as he gripped the grass, trying to withstand the pain as electricity surged up from the ground. Valen muttered a ripe curse. He wasn't the only one. The fuck were you thinking? Ares slurred those words, sounding as pained as Karis felt as he struggled to get back onto his feet. His gaze sought Enyo. She shook off the aftershocks of Valen's attack and popped to her feet, just as one of the demonic brutes shoved to his. She clashed with him again, keeping him away from Escher, who lay on his back in the slick grass. Karis scrambled over to him, pulse thundering blood rushing in his aching head as fear gripped him. He fluttered his fingers over his brother's throat and sagged as he found a pulse and Escher cracked his eyes open. The relief he had felt died the moment Karis looked into them. Crimson ringed his irises. 
Karis was tempted to teleport him away from the battle, even when he knew it was pointless. Escher would only teleport back again, his need to protect the gate and his need to protect his family driving him to be here. The only way to stop his brother from returning would be by locking him in the cage, and Escher wouldn't be able to handle that. Being in the cage and having his power stripped from him by it, together with the awareness that his family were fighting for their lives, would tip him over the edge again. So Karis helped him onto his feet instead and held on to him until he felt sure Escher could stand on his own. Valen yelped as water suddenly poured down on him. Son of a bitch! You deserve a lot worse than that, Escher grumbled, rubbing his temples and then his ears. What were you thinking? I doubt he was thinking, Karis muttered, earning a black look from a very drenched Valen. It worked, didn't it? Valen pointed towards the gate. There was a hole in the barrier, the edges of it sparking blue and white, an opening Karis was going to take. He kicked off was blasted backwards, thrown through the air with everyone else, as Cass slammed into the grass in a crouch. The auburn-haired woman pinned beneath her struggled and pressed her palms into Cass's chest. Light burst from them and Cass went flying. She disappeared in a swirl of black smoke and reappeared in Diamond's arms. Work with me here, not against me. Diamond lost his grip on her as she lunged forwards, her face a black mask of fury as her bright blue eyes narrowed on the witch. Red tendrils of light snaked towards Cass, and she swept her arm out as they reached her, sending them flying away from her as she advanced on the woman. The red streak shot to her right, ripping through a group of demons, melting them before Karis's eyes. The redhead launched another attack as Karis got to his feet for a second time that night, tempted to berate Cass, too. Blue see-through blades like sickles sliced through the air behind Cass, shot past her and spun towards the witch. The woman quickly waved her hand across the air before her, and the blade struck a barrier. This one made up of multiple layers, each a different shade. The outermost layer fractured, shattering like glass, and the sickles slammed into the next one, breaking the pale red construction. They struck the third green layer, and this time, they were the ones that shattered. The witch hurled her hands forwards, and light shot down from the sky. Blazes of crimson that struck the earth and tore it up as Diamond grabbed Cass and stepped with her again, narrowly avoiding being hit by one. Power charged the air, the tinny scent of magic filling it as it thickened. Green lightning chased across the clouds gathering overhead as Cass clashed with the witch again, unleashing a barrage of orange spears at her. They slammed into the ground as the witch dodged backwards, nothing more than a blur. Karis sent two waves of shadows rolling across the churned-up ground, one aimed at the witch, the other aimed at the three demonic males. Enyo leaped backwards as they reached her, clearing the way, and the shadows struck at the males she had been fighting, driving them back again, but not harming them. The spells protecting them were still in place. Karis turned his shadows on the witch as Escher focused on the gate and the fury again, ripping a startled, pained gasp from her. The ring that had opened on the gate began to close again as she lost control of it, as she clawed at her throat and turned wild eyes on his brother. Escher's knees gave out. Karis caught him before he hit the dirt. His brother couldn't do this alone. Karis growled as the opening in the barrier began to repair itself, mustered all his strength and commanded his shadows. They swept across the battlefield, snapping at the witch on their way past causing her to leap away from them and into the path of one of the spears cast through at her. He didn't pay attention to her as she screamed, or the weaker demons as his shadows engulfed them, feeding on them and growing stronger. He focused on the fury, on the closing gap in the barrier. Green lightning forked from the boiling black clouds, chased by an orange bolt that twined around it. Karis didn't see where it struck. He only saw his shadows rushing up the side of the barrier, heading for that opening. The ground shook hard, violet-green light dampened his vision, and his ears rang. Pain tore through him, through all his brothers, judging by the grunts that sounded around him, and Meadow shrieked. Karis's gaze darted to her, to the gate. Green lightning arced across the rings, sending them haywire. The colors shifted faster and faster, the rings spinning faster with them as bolts of magic chased over them, had some of the glyphs blazing white as others turned black. Look at what you fucking did, you stupid bitch, Meadow snapped, her violet eyes blazing as they landed on her witch. A sizzling bolt of green shot from the gate, struck the fury in her back and hurled her forwards, 
she slammed into the fractured barrier, a pained grunt bursting from her lips. The three demonic brutes were quick to rush to her side, hauling her onto her feet as she muttered things Karis couldn't quite hear. Violet black smoke billowed close to her, spreading outwards to form a portal large enough for her and the males. The red-headed witch made a break for it, too, panic lighting her features as she rushed to reach the portal, her fear tainting the air as she reached for Meadow and her demonic bodyguards. Don't leave me. It wasn't my fault. Cass raised her hand and a barrier shot up in front of the witch, cutting off her escape. The witch turned with a snarl and threw her hands towards Cass. Green lightning shot from the sky, rocketing towards Cass. Diamond lunged for her as she stared at it. Karis stepped. He roared as he appeared in front of her and shoved her backwards, as the bolt struck him and an inferno swept through him, followed by darkness, beautiful darkness. He turned on the witch with a snarl, baring his fangs, and launched at her. Her eyes widened and she stumbled backwards, mouthed something that had magic charging the air around her. She didn't get a chance to finish the spell. Karis slammed into her, knocking her off her feet, and grinned as his right hand closed around her throat. He shoved her to the ground, his grin only widening as her cry filled his ears, sweet music to his soul. He bore down on her, pinning her with one hand as she struggled, slapping at him harder and harder, each blow laced with magic that only fed the darkness pouring through him, only made him want more. He slashed at her chest, slicing the shoulders of her black dress, cutting grooves in her flesh that spilled crimson. Her panic swept over him, a delicious drug that had him clawing at her, grinning as she tried to fight him. She would pay for striking him. He raised his hand to strike her back, to punch a hole in her pretty skull. A strong hand gripped his wrist, holding back his blow. He looked up with a snarl peeling from his lips, a snarl that died as his eyes met soft jade ones. We can use her. Her voice curled around him, sank deep into his flesh and burrowed into his bones, warming them and chasing away the numbing cold, the darkness. He looked back down at the witch as she gasped beneath him, her face reddening as he continued to hold her throat. Karis yanked his arm free of Enyo's grip and felt the weight of her gaze on him, not only hers. His brothers and Cass were watching him too, waiting to see what he would do. He planted his left hand on the witch's forehead, splayed his fingers, and gripped her hard. Sleep. The moment that command left his lips, he felt the connection form between them, felt the power flow from him into her, and felt her suddenly relax beneath him. He released her and sank back, glared down at her as he battled the lingering darkness, fighting to subdue it again. Enya was right. The witch was more useful to him alive than dead. Alive, she might be able to tell him how to break the spell she had carved into the demons who protected the fury. Or at least she could tell Cass. Karis looked at his brothers, frowned. Diamond clutched his arm as Cass fussed over it, crimson rolling from the long sleeve of his navy roll neck to drip from his fingers. He wasn't the only one who had bled. Ares bore a few cuts on his left shoulder that looked like claw marks. Escher had a laceration across his thigh that might have been dealt by either a sword or an axe. Valen sported several wounds, including a nasty-looking one that slashed across the side of his neck. His violet-haired brother placed his hand over it and Crimson was quick to squeeze from between his fingers. The only one who hadn't bled was Enyo. He looked down at the tears in his black shirt. He didn't think the demons had caused the cuts, felt sure it had been the witch beneath him, but he couldn't be sure. He pushed off the witch, pulled his phone from his pocket, and messaged Merrick. His brother appeared a split second later with Iko and Katerina. Iko hurried to Valen, clutching a small medical box in front of her, her black pigtails bouncing with each step. Escher growled when she touched Valen's hand to ease it away from his neck, and she hesitated. Sorry, Escher muttered and scrubbed the back of his neck as he closed the gap between them. She smiled softly and touched his hand. I will tend to you next. You look tired. He nodded, his face somber, his blue eyes dull with fatigue Karis could feel in him. His brother looked as if he needed a distraction while Iko tended to Valen, so Karis turned to him and said, do you have enough power left to make it rain? We need to clear any blood from this place. Escher nodded and a gentle rain began to fall. Ares stepped in to help, burning sections of the grass to destroy not only the demon bodies that were littered everywhere, 
but the blood that was soaking into the ground, too. Take the witch to Scotland, Karis looked at Merrick. Merrick nodded and stooped, grabbed the witch and hauled her over his shoulder. Cass pointed to a thick leather band around the woman's wrist, one that had silver metal scrollwork running around it, forming leaves and branches, and ornate clasps that held blue stones that shone faintly in their hearts. I would say she is with a Swedish coven. I met a witch once who wore such a protective trinket, and she hailed from one deep in the north of that country. Cass shook her head, her pale blue eyes grave as they shifted from the witch to Diamond. I worry she is not the only witch seduced by the thought of gaining power and the place in the new world the enemy wants to create. Do you think she can use necromancy? Karis looked from the unconscious redhead to Cass. Cass was still for a moment, a thoughtful edge to her expression, and then she shook her head again. I do not think so. Very few have dared to seek information on the art, and I never came across anyone who was looking into it in the time I was studying it. I don't think so either, Diamond put in as he frowned at the place where the portal had been and was now gone. The demon seemed pretty intent on grabbing Cass. That was true. I'll go with you. Cass took a step towards Merrick. We need to make sure her powers are sufficiently contained so no one can find her and she cannot escape. Merrick nodded. Diamond took hold of Cass's arm and stepped with her at the same time as Merrick teleported with Katarina and the witch. Escher's blue gaze narrowed on the gate. Karis looked there, too, grimaced at the sight of it. Glyphs sparked and sent rainbow light arcing across the surface of the half-open gate, and he could feel the power leaking from it, power that had the grass beneath it blackening. I have no choice now. Escher kept his eyes locked on the damaged gate. I have to close it. His gaze finally shifted from it, landing on Karis, a wealth of concern in it. I am getting better. Karis reassured him, wanting to alleviate his brother's worry. The Tokyo Gate will be able to handle the strain. He wasn't sure it would, but he didn't want his brother to know that, didn't want any of them to see his worries, aware that it might stop Escher from closing the gate, or might push him too close to the edge again. Escher needed to hear that he was getting better, so Karis would keep telling him that. Escher nodded, flexed his fingers at his sides, and swallowed. Aiko came to him and slipped her hand into his, held it gently as she looked up at him, her dark eyes warm with love and worry. And fear. Escher smiled tightly at her, stroked her hair with his free hand, and swept it down to her jaw. He tilted her head up and bent to capture her lips, kissed her softly and slowly. Karis averted his gaze to give them a moment of privacy. It landed on Enyo. She looked at him, heat building in her green eyes heat that had him thinking about kissing her like that. How would she react if he did? Would she accept it as Aiko did? Would she reject him? He told himself that she wouldn't reject him. He might have been blind to her feelings before, but there was no denying she felt something for him now. There was no denying he felt something for her. He wanted to kiss her, craved the feel of her in his arms again, hungered to know the taste of her lips at last. Escher broke away from Aiko, pulling Karis's focus back to him, and Karis steeled himself as Escher stepped forwards, approaching the gate. Valen went with him, drew a short blade from the holster beneath his arm, and held it out to him. We're right here with you, buddy. Escher nodded and took the blade, sucked down a breath, and blew it out as he held his left wrist out above the gate, flinched as he drew the blade across it. Aiko rushed to him, fisted his wet shirt, and pressed her forehead to his spine as she held him from behind. Escher closed his eyes as blood dripped from his wrist, hit the gate, and slowly began to spread across the horizontal rings, muting the colors. Agonizing minutes ticked past as Escher worked to seal it, an eternity in which he sliced his vein open two more times, in which Aiko wrapped her arms around him and clutched him tightly. Escher's face twisted into a sneer, and Aiko tightened her grip. Karis moved forwards in time with Ares, placed his hand on Escher's shoulder as Ares mirrored him, and gripped Escher tightly, showing his brother that he was there, supporting him in the only way he could, hoping it would keep him grounded and keep his other side at bay. There was no telling what that side of Escher would do if it woke now. Escher slashed his wrist a fourth time. Blood ran freely from the wound, splattering across the gate, 
dulling the colors of the rings as they rotated a few feet above the grass, taking the blood with them, spreading it for Escher. The innermost ring began to contract, the gate pulsing as it sank into the central violet disc. It's working, Karis murmured and palmed Escher's shoulder. You're doing great. On the other side of him, Ares did the same. Almost there. Karis could feel it as the power the gate emitted stabilized and then began to fade. Escher gritted his teeth and leaned forwards, and Karis held him upright, keeping him from falling. His brothers snarled and bared fangs at him, crimson invading his eyes as he locked them on Karis. And then he looked down at the delicate hands pressed against his chest. His face crumpled and he dropped the blade, reached for Iko's hands with his free one and clutched them. He closed his eyes again and another ring receded. The gate sparked with bright arcs of electricity and Escher grimaced. You're doing great, Ares whispered and rubbed his shoulder. You have this, just a little more. Escher nodded stiffly. The gate settled again, but Karis could feel the drain on Escher's strength, the effort it took to simply get it back under his control. Karis's gut twisted and clenched hard. If it was taking this much effort to just control the damaged gate, was draining Escher this much, he didn't want to think about how badly closing it would affect his brother. He had the terrible feeling Escher was going to be asleep for a long time. The next ring shrank into the gate, the power it emitted falling again, leaving only one ring left. It shone crimson, completely covered in Escher's blood, and Escher wavered on his feet as it began to contract, the rotation of it slowing. When it seeped back into the gate, the violet disc pulsed brightly and then grew darker and darker as it too contracted. It winked out of existence. Karis couldn't feel the gate, felt nothing as he stood there. As Escher collapsed and he sank to his knees with him, Iko sobbed against his brother's back, and Karis shifted his hand to her shoulder. He will be all right. Words he couldn't quite bring himself to believe, not as he gazed at his brother's ashen face. He willed Escher to be strong, to fight to return to Iko and to him. Valen stepped forwards. I'll get him home. Karis nodded, grateful for his assistance. He moved aside and pushed onto his feet as Valen helped Iko onto hers. Ares took hold of her as Valen lifted Escher into his arms, and they all disappeared. Karis lingered. Enyo did too. She came to him, silent, but he could feel her support, felt it as strength that flowed into him as he stared at where Escher had been. He had wanted to close a gate and draw the enemy out, but now that it had happened, he felt it was a bad idea. Fear for Escher and fear for what was to come combined inside him to strip them of the strength Enyo poured into him as she touched his hand, as her fingers grazed his palm and drew his gaze to her face. He worried that Callistos was right. He was being reckless, and it had cost Escher dearly. Tears filled his eyes as a thousand emotions erupted inside him, as they tore down his strength and seemed to consume every part of him, a whirlwind that had him spinning. Lost. Enyo gathered him into her arms. Karis wrapped his around her and clung to her, the anchor he badly needed as he weathered a terrible storm, as he struggled to keep his head above water and stop himself from drowning. From listening to that dark voice in his heart that whispered at him to find a pill, a pill would take this pain away. She murmured softly into his ear, Let's go home. Home. He wanted to go there. Not the home she spoke of, but the underworld. He wanted to be there again, away from this madness, this weakness that infested him, even when he knew he couldn't escape it. Returning to the underworld now wouldn't solve anything. It wouldn't turn back the clock. It wouldn't free him of his problems. He had to face them. He held Enyo, breathed in her lilac scent, and absorbed the warmth of her, the strength she gave to him, strength he needed and would use. He couldn't change the past, but he could still have the future he craved with every drop of his blood. He would fight his demons for that, and he would win the only thing he had ever wanted. Her heart. Chapter 19 Enya watched Karis as he sat beside Merrick at the low dining table, his eyes on the screen of the laptop Merrick had open in front of him. Rory arrowed through her and not for the first time since Escher had closed the gate in Hong Kong. It had hit her from time to time over the last few days, 
most often when she was watching Karis like this and he was unaware of her. Didn't try to hide his own worry and fatigue from her. Not that he could really hide it from her. Enyo could feel it in him. He wouldn't listen to her when she tried to make him take a break, though. Brushed her off and carried on working, poring over all the information he and his brothers had gathered over the years, trying to figure out the enemy's next move. Karis was sure the enemy would want to rescue the witch. Enyo wasn't so sure. It had looked to her as if the Fury had been intent on abandoning the female. The enemy's next move wasn't the only thing weighing heavily on Karis, though. Escher still hadn't woken, showed no signs of regaining consciousness. Cassandra had used spells on him every day, checking his condition. The only good news was that it wasn't getting worse. It wasn't getting better, either. I could take another look in her mind, Karis said. Words that had Enyo moving because she was damned if that was going to happen. You hit a wall last time. Her voice seemed loud in the long room of the mansion, a house that had been too quiet since they had brought Escher back from Hong Kong. The air in the mansion was somber, had sucked the light right out of everyone. Even Callistos was quiet, all of his jokes and wisecracks nowhere to be found now that they all badly needed someone to brighten the mood. I can break through it. Karis looked at her, his green eyes as serious as she had ever seen them. She shook her head, because that wasn't the only feeling that shone in them. There was despair, too, and a lot of fatigue. Too much fatigue. The episodes he suffered were growing further apart, but they were still a daily occurrence, and more than once she'd had to convince him that he didn't need his pills, and had weathered his anger as the darker side of him had surged to the fore. Those episodes were taking their toll on him, as well as Escher's condition. Pushing himself now was a sure way of triggering another episode. If you probe her mind right now, who knows what will happen? I heard about the incident with the wraith. As those words left her lips, his green eyes narrowed and he looked at each of his brothers in turn. All of them diligently avoided meeting his gaze. No one wanted to be the one to confess they had told on him. She was glad his brother Ares had told her about it, even when it tormented her. The thought that Karis had been so reckless as to push himself to the limit had probably come perilously close to breaking his own mind when he had attempted to force the wraith's one open to him, had sickness pooling inside her, made her want to lay down the law with him to keep him safe. You need to gather your strength again. She wasn't going to put her foot down too hard, just enough that he would take the time he needed to grow stronger before he made another attempt because the last one had left him drained for over a day. The sense of power he constantly emitted as weak as it had been when he had lost consciousness after their rooftop fight. Let Cassandra continue working on her for now, until you have regained your strength. She stood over him, silently pleading him to listen to her. For a moment, he looked as if he would argue, but then he loosed a long sigh. Very well. He pushed the pieces of paper stacked in front of him on the low wooden table aside and leaned back. He stretched his arms above his head and stifled a yawn. Merrick closed the laptop and pushed onto his feet, rolled his hips and grimaced. I would kill for a proper dining table and chairs, something a little more western. Some of the brothers murmured in agreement. None of them looked ready to go out and change the furniture, though. She knew why. This place was Escher's sanctuary, and he had it exactly the way he liked it, which meant if the brothers changed something without his consent, he would be furious when he woke. None of his brothers wanted to push him, and altering the furniture while he was asleep would be a sure way of tipping him right over the edge again. That somber air fell again, bringing everyone down with it. Enyo fidgeted with the belt of her skirt, trying to keep her own dark thoughts at bay ones that had begun to plague her over the last day or two. She kept finding herself standing in one spot, seeking the connection between her and Olympus, waiting for her brother to summon her. She glanced at Karis. He was the reason her brother hadn't yanked her back to Olympus by force, even though she knew he would be displeased with this turn of events, with her. He hadn't been happy when Ares and Megan had come to bring her back here, and she could think of only one reason why he hadn't barged into her life and dragged her home. Hades. She had the feeling that the god-king of the underworld had made it clear to her brother that she was fighting on the side of his sons now, all so she could remain with Karis and help him. 
Enya rubbed her hands over the front of her stomach, over the hard black leather that covered her breastplate. It was almost strange to be wearing her armor again, but Cassandra and Marinda had insisted she hand over the clothes the sorceress had lent her so they could wash them. Cass had offered another garment for her to wear, but when she had announced it would be one of her rather sexy long black dresses, Enyo had refused. The thought of wearing such a dress left her feeling oddly vulnerable and exposed. Nervous. She kept thinking about what Karis would make of her if she wore such a dress how he would react to the sight of her in something so sexy and feminine. Part of her wanted to know, the rest of her was too afraid to find out. She had contemplated returning to Olympus for some clothing of her own, but she feared that if she went back to the house that her brother would never let her leave again, and she needed to be here with Karis. He stood and came to her, the worry that had been in his eyes turning to warmth as he looked down into her eyes. When he looked at her like that, she felt as if she was the most important person in the world, the only person in his world. She felt beautiful, wanted. Walk with me. He held his arm out to her and she slipped hers around it, savored the feel of him and his warm masculine scent, as he shifted closer to her and led her out into the garden. Night was falling again. You seem troubled, she murmured. He tilted his head back and sighed at the darkening sky. A little. He had been on edge since Callistos had returned from a meeting in the underworld, one that had confirmed the information she had brought to Karis. Nemesis had been recruiting allies. Many families had confirmed that members of their houses were missing, and several of them had known they were going to visit Nemesis. The goddess had recruited males and females from every realm, from Hellspawn through to demigods. If Nemesis and the enemy have been building their army, then we must build one too. She had been holding that back for so long that it burst from her lips as if a dam had given way. She didn't give him a chance to respond. She let the flood happen, a torrent that she desperately needed to sweep him up in so it would convince him to do something other than shutting her down. We should speak with Zeus and Poseidon about the possibility of them joining the battle. Karis opened his mouth. Enyo spoke before he could. I know what you are going to say. But Hades needs allies in this war. Whatever is coming, it is going to be big. I can feel it in my gut, and it's unsettling me. It struck her that part of her unease, that her reason for constantly expecting her brother to summon her, was because she could feel war brewing, felt it building inside her, and knew that at any moment it would erupt. Karis stilled and stared at the horizon, a grim light entering his green eyes as he set his jaw. What do you see? she asked, because he wasn't looking at the here and now. He was looking at the future of this world, at what would happen to it if the enemy was allowed to continue on their current path. It looks bad. His distant tone made her want to shake him back to her, together with the corona of scarlet that ringed his pupils. The darkness still had a hold on him, had surfaced like this more than once since she had stopped him from killing the witch. His body tensed, his lips compressing as his black eyebrows knitted hard. The crimson faded, leaving clear green behind. He didn't take his eyes off the sky. We are not welcome in those realms. His deep voice rolled over her, stronger again now, and his gaze slid to lock with hers. He slowly turned his head towards her and then came to face her. And I doubt father will accept their help, even if you could convince my uncles to speak with him. But, she bit her tongue, cutting herself off, trying to let the argument fade. It refused to go, the thought of Hades foolishly denying help riling her almost as badly as the fact he had put his beautiful son through hell for two centuries. Karis needed powerful allies if he was going to make it through this battle. She wasn't sure whether it was her heart that kept telling her that, fear of losing him at the helm to fill her mind with thoughts of him being torn from her or whether it was her instincts as a goddess of war. What she did know was that telling Karis his father was a fool, that his ridiculous pride in this matter was only going to get his sons killed, was not the way to go about convincing him to speak with his uncles. Karis had a little bit too much of that pride himself. He was liable to turn on her if she dared to insinuate that his father was in the wrong, or that he and his brothers were too weak to fight this enemy alone. Very well. If it will ease your mind, I will speak with them. Karis turned away from her. All of the fight left her, 
the arguments she had been practicing in her head fading away as she stared at his back. She stood there, watching the distance between them growing, unsure what she had done to win and convince him to talk to his uncles. He paused and looked back at her, warmth in his emerald gaze as it met hers and held his hand out to her. It struck her that he was doing this because he knew it would make her feel better, and that was the only reason. He didn't believe his father would allow Poseidon and Zeus to interfere, or that his uncles would even dare to speak with Hades, but he was willing to do this because he wanted to take away the fear she felt. Gods, she wasn't sure she could love him any more than she already did, but in that moment she fell a little deeper in love with him. She went to him, took hold of his hand, and let him lead her back to the house. When they stepped inside, his gaze sought Ares where he sat on the cream couch facing the huge television, his dark eyes dull, not with fatigue, but hurt. He was missing Megan again. She had taken the time to speak to him about the carrier, and had noticed how his eyes had brightened when he had been given the chance to talk about his wife. When Karis had his attention, he said, I will not be long. Enyo has suggested we petition our uncles for aid or at the very least help an asking father to gather more allies for us. Ares pushed onto his feet. I can talk to Zeus. Valen snagged his arm and dragged him back down. I'll go. Zeus loves me. Valen grinned, his golden eyes bright with mischief, which made Enyo feel Zeus did not love him and wouldn't be pleased to see him, a feeling that Charis backed up when he sighed and Callistos only strengthened as he looked at Ares. He'll get us all killed, Callistos wearily rose from the couch. I should probably go with him, keep an eye on him like. Enyo wasn't sure it was wise to send the two most reckless brothers to speak with Zeus. Merrick will go with Valen. Karis eased her mind until he spoke again. I will go with Enyo and speak with Poseidon. She stiffened and did her best not to show the tension that suddenly cranked her tight inside and had her regretting suggesting speaking with Poseidon, too. Perhaps we should only speak with Zeus. I am sure he could speak to both Poseidon and Hades for us. She schooled her features when Karis frowned at her, curiosity shining in his emerald eyes, eyes that seemed to peer deep into her soul. She looked away from him, settling her gaze on Valen. I will speak with Zeus. Valen and Merrick will speak with Zeus, and you and I will speak with Poseidon. Karis took hold of her arm, and she didn't get a chance to protest. Darkness embraced them, and then warm light washed over her, carrying the scent of the sea. She looked at the blue gate that towered vertically before her in the harbor of Olympus, obscuring the view of the turquoise sea. Rings of glyphs in cerulean, aquamarine, and cobalt lazily rotated around a shimmering, swirling, watery circle. It rippled with color, with flashes of light that looked like sunbeams cutting through a tropical ocean. Oh, gods. Her pulse shot off the scale and she fought for words, for ones that would convince Karis to remain here in Olympus and speak with Zeus, rather than stepping through the gate to Poseidon's realm. Karis tugged her forwards, ascending invisible steps that brought them to the heart of the vertical gate, and didn't hesitate to step into it. She braced herself as the gently rippling water swept around her. The sensation was as unsettling as the thought of where they were going. The gate swept around her, as if she were underwater, but she could breathe and not a drop of liquid touched her. She stepped out of the other side of the gate, completely dry, not even a speck of water on her black and silver chest piece, the leather slats of her skirt, or her boots. Karis had remained dry, too his black dress shirt and trousers still neatly pressed and perfect. He paused on the long causeway that led from the gate. The wide white marble road led her eye forwards, the crystal blue water that flanked it a stunning contrast to it and the elegant gold statues that lined the edges of it on turquoise plinths. She hadn't been here in centuries, and seeing it again still took her breath away. Beyond the causeway, the Champagne Beach embraced the water, and the promenade that swept in both directions around the enormous island. White buildings with accents of gold and turquoise clustered along the shore, smaller at the promenade but growing larger and spaced further apart the closer they were to the heart of the city, where the island rose up to a peak. Atop that peak, a glittering gold palace stood. Beautiful Greek temples that had white columns and turquoise friezes were surrounded by lush green and colorful blooms. The causeway led straight to it, 
rising up the hill with cascades on either side of it, wide canals that had waterfalls positioned at the end of each road that circled the city. She glanced to her left and then her right, drinking in the blue sky where it met even bluer water, and the pale rocky islands that surrounded the central one where she stood. On two of the larger islands, one on either side of her, huge gold statues of Poseidon towered. The turquoise and gold tridents they held pointed at the gate, as if the god was ready to hurl them should an intruder step through it. Kara strode forwards, a black shadow in a bright land. She followed him and drew up beside him, still battling her nerves but unwilling to let him walk alone as he reached the end of the causeway. People milling along the promenade and some on the fishing boats docked in the small harbor all stopped to stare at Karis. If he felt the weight of their curious gazes, he didn't show it. He walked with his head held high, his green eyes fixed on the palace looming on the peak of the island high above them. The staring didn't end when they left the promenade behind, beginning their ascent. People on the streets that ran down either side of the cascades, lining the buildings there and joining the roads together, stopped to glance at him, to exchange whispered comments. Some of them recognized him, most of them young women. Enyo scowled at the ones who spoke his name, who remarked on his looks or his standing. They were quick to scurry away into the shadows. Escher would love this place, Karis said. Enyo looked at him and found him gazing at the cascade to her left, and beyond it to one of the wide streets that formed a ring around the island. A canal filled the space between the two sides of the road, crossed by bridges in several places, the bright blue water a streak of color against all the white marble. In the water, colorful fish darted around. She watched them as she walked with Karis, moving closer to him when more females paused to admire him. She remembered that Poseidon had given his favor to Escher, and how the two of them had seemed close the few times she had seen them together. She didn't want to be the one to tell Poseidon what had happened to Escher, but if it would sway him, then she would mention it, because this mission had to succeed. She needed to convince Poseidon to lend his forces to Karis, and convince him to speak with Hades, too. At the very least, she needed him to speak with his brother. They reached the high wall of the palace and ascended the broad white steps that led up to a formal garden that filled the space around the temples, level with the top of the wall. Along the edge of the garden, golden statues of Poseidon stood. Elegant white marble fountains flanked the path that carried her forwards, towards one of the lower temples. She banked right, heading for the gatehouse beside it, the only entry point for the palace. The brightly clothed people coming and going from Poseidon's temple glanced at her and then at Karis. Enyo ignored them and approached the guards, two males dressed in white and turquoise breastplates and skirts, who stood side by side with their golden tridents crossed. They took one look at her and Karis and stepped aside, bowing their heads and easing their tridents back. Karis led the way up the narrow road, following it around another two columned buildings made entirely of gold and out onto a broad paved area before the main palace. Three rows of enormous white columns supported the gold triangular pediment of the temple-like building, the turquoise, lapis lazuli, and marble frieze depicting Poseidon and his wife on a chariot drawn by creatures that had the front half of a horse and the rear of a sea serpent or fish. She stepped to one side as three females bustled past her, two of them carrying gold bowls overflowing with rose petals, while the third carefully held a pitcher of oil. Karis raised an eyebrow at them. I see Poseidon's tastes haven't changed. He still prefers his females to bear more flesh than is respectable. Enyo looked at the clothing they wore, layers of colorful sheer fabric that covered only their breasts and was fastened with gold, and two long strips of matching fabric that hung from a gold belt around their waists, barely covering their backsides and the front of their hips, and then at herself. Her skirt was short, barely reached mid-thigh. Was that respectable enough for Karis? He moved and she hurried to keep up, her pulse pounding faster again as they entered the main temple. A female greeted him, bowing her head, causing tendrils of bright gold hair to spill down her ample chest. Son of Hades, Karis dipped his chin. I wish to speak with my uncle. She nodded again and swept her arm out, gesturing towards the grand doors at the end of the hallway. She led the way, and Enyo watched Karis like a hawk, 
Sure, he would admire the female as she gracefully walked ahead of him. He didn't. He kept his eyes fixed on the door. Her pulse settled a little. It didn't last long. The moment the twin gold doors opened, it spiked right back up. Her breath leaked from her when the female left them and she looked at the room. The golden white throne that stood on the high dais at the other end of the room was empty. We can get Zeus to speak with him. Enyo reached for Karis's arm, unwilling to waste this chance she had been given. A deep male voice rolled from beyond the white and turquoise fluted columns that lined the room, supporting the roof. I am the only one home, but you can speak with me. I am in charge in my father's absence. She tensed. Karis arched an eyebrow at her. She cursed him for noticing. Cursed the blue-haired male who rounded one of the white columns and smiled at her his aquamarine eyes brightening as they landed on her. Before she could say or do anything, he strode towards her and swept her up into a hug, lifting her boots off the white marble floor. It is good to see you, Enyo. Enyo pressed against his bare shoulders. Karis growled. Nico set her down and eased her away from him, slowly, as if she was a bomb liable to detonate if he moved too quickly. Or perhaps he feared Karis would explode at him. She glanced at Karis. Didn't miss how he scowled at Nikos, or how his look only darkened as it dropped to his body. She swore she could read his mind, knew the dark path his thoughts traversed as black invaded his irises. Nikos wore the traditional garb of his position as a son of Poseidon, which meant he wore only a thick gold belt that dipped from his waist to under his navel, almost following the curve of muscle that arched over his hips. Two long heavy strips of fine cobalt fabric hung from that belt, one at the front that was only a little wider than the center of his thighs, and one from the back that covered most of his rear, leaving the sides of his legs and his hips completely exposed. A fine gold braid linked the two pieces a few inches down from the belt, giving him some modesty. The silver embroidery on the front strip caught the light of the torches as he turned towards Karis a golden glow shimmering across the depiction of shells and sea life. It caught on the iridescent swirls and arcs on his skin that curled around over his hips and wrapped around his thighs, too, markings that were unique to him. The firstborn of Hades. Nikos looked at Enyo, a smile curving his broad lips. And the goddess of war. Let me guess. This is about the war brewing in the underworld. The rumors about it have reached our shores. It is why we seek your father, Nikos. She did her best to ignore the way Karis's eyes drilled into her and the darkness she could feel rising inside him. Nikos ran a hand through his short blue hair. All these years and I finally see you again, and it isn't even me you have come to see. He glanced at Karis again. Her heart seized. He is handsome. Nikos smiled slowly, an air of mischief about it. I see now why you broke off our engagement. Karis was on him in a flash, had his right hand around Nikos's throat, and had him pinned to one of the columns. Nikos wheezed, If not a little dark like his father. Enyo wanted to close the distance between her and Karis and seize his arm, but planted her boots to the floor. Intervening physically would only provoke his darker side. She had witnessed the possessive nature of the blood of Hades and how easily jealousy had turned the god-king dark, had pushed him to attack her own brother. Karis had that same blood running in his veins. If she seized hold of him, he was liable to misinterpret her actions, would believe she was trying to protect Nikos, was defending his cousin. I never had feelings for him. She let those words slip from her lips, felt them fall heavily in the room, saw them shake Karis. His green gaze edged towards her. She stood her ground, gathered her courage, and pushed the rest of the words out. I barely even knew Nikos when my brother and his father decided we should marry. She clenched her fists at her sides to stop herself from reaching for Karis. Nikos is only a friend. I do not feel for him the way I feel about you. Karis lowered Nikos and viciously shoved him into the column before letting him go and stepping back. We really do need to speak with your father, she said as Karis backed towards her. As he came to stand at her side, his gaze never strained from Nikos, staking a claim on her. She had half a mind to complain about his behavior, didn't like anyone thinking they owned her, but let it go. He had inherited a protective streak from his father, 
and she had witnessed it enough times in Hades to know better than to provoke that side of Karis. Besides, part of her liked it. Hades is intent on allowing none outside of those in the underworld to participate in this war, she said. Valen and Merrick have gone to speak with Zeus about convincing Hades to listen to reason. We came to speak with Poseidon. I cannot help there. Nikos rubbed his reddened throat. Father is often one of his moods brooding about something, which was very like the God King. He had a bad habit of disappearing for weeks on end whenever someone upset him. My brothers are all out of the realm on a mission. Nikos crossed the short span of the lapis lazuli golden white mosaic that formed a pattern on the floor, reached the dais and sank down onto the edge of it, his breaths loud as his broad chest heaved. Nikos? She risked a step towards him, concern building inside her as he paled, apparently struggling to recover from Karis's attack. Which was strange. Karis hadn't been that rough with him. She canted her head and studied him. Are you unwell? Nico shook his head and then gave a half-hearted shrug. Nothing for you to worry about. Just a little curse. My brothers have it under control. I think. He pulled down a shuddering breath and wheezed as he exhaled and lifted his head. His dull blue eyes fixed on her, and his smile lacked emotion, looked forced to her. I just have moments. She reached for him. He shook his head again. She could feel the pressing weight of Karis's gaze on her back, wanted to risk his wrath to check on Nikos, but tamped down that urge, reasoning with herself that she would hardly be helping him if Karis attacked him again because she had dared to touch him. Nikos alleviated some of her worry as he pushed back onto his feet, the color returning to his skin again as he stopped rubbing his throat. See? All better. This time his smile was genuine. I'll speak to father. Maybe I can get a messenger to him. No messengers, Karis snapped. They are working for the enemy. All of them? Nikos arched a blue eyebrow at him. Not all of them, but they are not to be trusted. Not right now. Enyo's brow furrowed as she looked Nikos over. Are you sure you are all right? Nice of you to be worried, but it is unnecessary. Talos is following up a lead as we speak, which comforted her. Talos was competent, a very capable and intelligent male. If any of his four brothers could help Nikos with this curse, Talos could. I'll speak to father. Go. Nikos jerked his chin towards her. Before I find myself rudely pinned to another column by my cousin. She glanced over her shoulder at Karis. His green eyes were narrowed on Nikos, black ringing them. She backed up to him and took his hand. His eyes widened and dropped to their joined hands. She nodded to Nikos. Thank you. He shrugged that one off and eased back down to sit on the dais. Call if you need me to fight. Like hell she would. Nikos was in no condition to go into battle. Whatever curse afflicted him, it was strong. She led Karis out of the temple, down through the streets to the gate, and couldn't step into it quickly enough. When they reached the other side, Karis was swift to wrap his arms around her. She stared up into his eyes as he teleported with her into fathomless black that sparked with crimson around his dilated pupils, shivered from the possessive way he stared at her and how tightly he held her. A feeling washed through her. Things were about to change between them. Chapter 20 Anger scoured Karis's insides like acid, lit his blood on fire, and devoured all rational thought, leaving him seething with rage as he stepped with Enyo, sweeping her away from the reach of the handsome god of the sea she had been betrothed to. Anger with that god. Anger that Enyo had hugged that male, pressing her curves to his near-naked body. Anger that he had let her slip from his grasp once. Anger that he still hadn't found the strength to tell her how he felt. He landed deep in the garden of the Tokyo mansion with her, wrapped in the shadowy night. She frowned as she tried to pull back and take in her surroundings, as he kept hold of her and refused to let her go. He stared down at her, his heart drumming faster and faster, blood burning hotter. It was now or never. He needed to get the words out, because he felt he might explode if he didn't. The moon peeked out from behind a cloud, bathing her face in pale light stealing his breath as her beauty hit him hard. Are you unwell? She whispered as she gazed up at him. 
He thought about how she had asked Nikos that same question, with the same tender concern in her voice. Showing affection to her former betrothed, his own damned cousin. The anger rose a little more, flared a bit hotter in his veins, rousing his darker side. He fought it, wrestled for control, but it refused to obey him, and fear joined the rage that poured through him. Fear he might hurt her. He struggled to breathe through it. Karis? Enyo's gentle palms framed his face, the lilac scent of her growing stronger as she pressed closer. Her eyes darted between his as her brow furrowed. I am sorry I took you there. Nikos was never more than a friend to me. A friend like I am to you, he bit out, his words sharp as a blade, nerves getting the better of him as they swamped him, as they roused a blur of feelings he couldn't decipher, ones that tore him in several directions. He felt like a youth again as he waited, standing on trembling legs, afraid of the answer to that question. She lowered one hand to his chest and glided it down his arm, cupped his hand and lifted it. He stared at her fingers as she stroked them over the ring he wore on his thumb. Not like that. Not like us, she whispered. He felt the nerves in her, too, an echo of the fear that filled him. He tried to tamp it down and master it, failed spectacularly. I've spent the last two hundred years thinking I still loved you. Those words came out harder than he had meant, and he cursed as she snatched her hand away from his and stepped back, severing the connection between them. Tears glistened in her jade eyes, and she lifted her hand to her chest, covering the spot over her heart with it. God's damn it. The hurt inside her beat inside him, too, traveling through the fragile bond that had always connected them. Every instinct inside him screamed at him to take that hurt away. He stepped into her framed her face with his palms and gazed deep into her eyes. Now I am certain that I still love you. She just stared at him, her eyes wide. This wasn't going well. I love you, he repeated, some foolish part of him saying that she hadn't heard him, and that was the only reason she hadn't responded. He pressed onwards, nerves be damned, somehow finding the courage to keep marching forwards, to tear down the walls that had always been around his heart and expose it to her. I liked you the moment we met, and I fell in love with you the first time you kicked my arse six centuries ago. Her black eyebrows shot up. Damn you for not telling me. I'm telling you now, he countered, a frown marrying his eyebrows as urges erupted inside him, goading him into giving in to them, urges that had his blood thundering, heating, she opened her mouth, no doubt to complain about the manner of his confession again. Karis covered it with his own, captured her lips, and silenced her with a kiss. His hand dropped to her nape, and he gripped it as he pulled her against him, bending her to his will as he angled his head and kissed her deeper, willing her to respond. She surrendered on a sweet moan, her lips moving against his, tongue sending a thousand thrills arcing down his spine as she opened for him and it brushed his. He groaned and tugged her closer, so not even a molecule of air could exist between them, palmed her nape and kissed her harder as centuries of need spiraled out of control inside him. He tried to be gentle with her, afraid he would harm her as those needs got the better of him, as heat rolled through him and had him burning for her. She seized hold of his shoulders and gripped them so hard pain shot down his arms, lancing his bones took command of the kiss and addled his mind as her tongue caressed his, as she pressed closer still. The hard plates of her breastplate dug into his chest through his black shirt, and he cursed it as he lowered one hand to her back, burning with a need to feel her bare skin beneath his questing fingers, aware that out here in the garden anyone could see them. He stepped with her, appearing in his room this time, couldn't hold back the moment he realized that Ares wasn't in the next room. His senses placed most of his brothers in the main room of the house, but Cal and Ares weren't there. Cal must have taken Ares to see Megan, meaning Karis would probably have privacy for the rest of the night. He groaned at that thought. A night with Enyo wasn't enough, but it was a start, the first of thousands if he had his way. He found the buckles on the side of her breastplate, fumbled with them, and cursed when his hand shook so badly he couldn't get the strap loose. He broke the kiss, his breath sawing from his lips as he attacked the buckle, as the strap finally gave. 
Enyo's hands knocked against his as she worked on the second one, her breaths coming faster, her chest straining and drawing his gaze to it as the strap slipped free. She peeled the breastplate from her and cast it aside, her hands flying to the buttons of his shirt as he drank his fill of her. He focused on his hands, steadying them as he inched them closer to her hips, shuddered as he made contact with the strip of warm, soft skin between the bottom of her cream bandeau and the belt of her skirt. Her fingers stilled halfway down his chest, pausing at their work on one of the buttons of his shirt. Her frantic breaths bathed the exposed V of his skin as he smoothed his hands over her stomach, edging them upwards. She tensed, her breath hitching as he skimmed his thumbs along the undersides of her breasts. His heart hammered, a crazy beat against his chest that had him breathless. Anticipation curled through him, cranking him tighter, sending all his blood rushing south. He struggled for air as he molded his hands over her breasts, as he stroked the top of the bandeau and edged it downwards. He stared at her breasts, slowly exposing the creamy swell of them, that anticipation coiling tighter as he edged the material lower to reveal dusky pink nipples that beaded on contact with the cool air. His mouth watered, the urge that flooded him too strong to deny. On a low groan, he swooped on her left breast, relishing her soft cry as he tugged her nipple between his lips and sucked. Her hands flew to his hair, fingers tunneling into it, gentle one moment and fierce the next. She gripped him tightly, clutched him to her as she arched towards him, as his name fell from her lips on a whispered plea. Karis closed his eyes and sucked, gripped her waist and tugged her to him, bending her over backwards as he gathered her against him. She groaned and clawed at his shoulders, his back, ripped the shirt right off it and sent a thousand volts of hot pleasure rolling through him as her hands met his bare skin. She palmed his shoulders and then his nape, gripping it hard as she held him to her, as she arched to meet his mouth. He moaned and lowered his hands, growled when he met the hard plates of her skirt. He had forgotten she wasn't naked. He needed her naked. Karis couldn't drag himself away from her breast, though, ended up running his hands around her waist, seeking the straps that held her skirt in place. When he couldn't find them, he snarled a curse and pulled back. His eyes darted over the belt of her skirt, seeking the way to her. Enyo found the buckles for him, just beyond her right hip, and he knocked her hands aside, eager to be the one to undress her. Impatient, just as impatient as his goddess, apparently. She tore at his trousers, making swift work of his belt and his button, only slowing when she lowered the zipper. Karis stilled, letting her skirt fall from his hands as he looked down at himself, as he watched her easing his black slacks down, as he thought about where this was heading. His cock strained against his trunks, a rigid outline that was pronounced in the low light. Enyo reached for it, his breath lodged in his throat, his head felt a little light. He tensed when her fingers made contact, trembled as she tentatively stroked him, setting him aflame, igniting needs that stole control of him. He dropped his hand and pressed it to hers, holding it against his hard shaft as he ached with a need for more, to feel her skin against him, to be inside her. Her hand shook as he shoved his trunks down with his other hand, exposing himself, and brought her palm back against his erection the moment it was free. A quiet moan escaped her, sent heat and pleasure rippling through him together with how she wrapped her fingers around him. He swallowed and couldn't stop himself from leaning forwards as she stroked him, as she rubbed her thumb over the blunt crown, her gaze scalding him. It wasn't enough. He needed more. He seized hold of her, pulled her to him, and captured her nipple again, breathing hard against it as he lowered his hands and clutched her backside through her flimsy underwear as he lifted her into his arms. He twisted with her, carried her to the bedding in the center of the room as he worshipped her breasts, as her fingers maddened him, stroking his shaft. He laid her down on the black bedclothes and covered her, seated himself between her thighs as they fell open, groaned against her as she opened for him. She writhed beneath him, her hips rocking up to meet his, keeping his fervor at boiling point, pushing him right to the edge. He gripped her underwear as he kissed his way across to her other breast and tore it from her as he trailed his lips up to capture hers. He swallowed her gasp as the material covering her ripped, as he cast it aside and lowered himself, pressing his rigid length to her slick heat. Gods. Karis kissed her hard, need riding him 
pushing him over the edge and stealing control from him. He wedged her legs apart, shoving her left knee to open her to him, and gripped his cock, groaned as he rubbed the head through her folds and guided it inside her. She stilled, her breath sawing from her lips, fingers pressing hard into his shoulders and his backside as she kissed him, as she pulled him down to her, forcing him into her. On a low growl born of the desperation flooding him, he drove his hips forwards, seating himself to the hilt, swallowed her sweet cry as he filled her. The clamor in his mind dissipated as her heat surrounded him, as it hit him that they were joined at last, that a moment he had dreamed about a million times was finally a reality. He drifted in the eye of the storm, calm at last as he drew back from her, as he gazed down at her and she looked up at him, the desperation and wildness that had been in her eyes gone now. Did she feel this too? This sense of rightness, of peace? He stroked the backs of his fingers down her cheek as he lay inside her, feeling connected to her. She tilted her head towards his hand and kissed his fingers, looked back into his eyes, and floored him. Love shone in them, love as deep and endless as the feeling that flowed through him. Karis lowered his head and softly captured her lips, kissed her gently, with all the reverence she deserved as he began to move inside her, slowly withdrawing almost all the way before filling her again in unhurried strokes. She wrapped her arms around him, tangling him in them, and he did the same to her, holding her to him as he kissed her, made love with her. Nothing had ever felt so right. Sensation built inside him as he rocked into her, as she moaned softly against his lips each time he filled her, whispered his name and had him floating in her arms, lost in her but found at the same time. When she strained against him, her breaths coming faster, he held her closer and drove deeper into her, quickening the pace of his thrusts as he sensed her rising need, as he edged closer to his own release. He held it back, focused on her as he dropped his right hand to her hip and gripped it, holding her in place. Her legs fell open, her hand shifting to the back of his neck, clutching him to her as her kiss grew more frantic again. He palmed her breast with his other hand, rolled her nipple between his fingers and groaned as she moaned, as she arched into his touch and softly begged for more. The need building inside him demanded the same thing, had his pulse pounding faster and cock growing harder as she clenched him. He grunted as she gripped him, as pleasure shot down his length and crashed through him shoved him to the edge of losing control again. Enyo surrendered to it first, had him on his back before he was aware of what had happened. She rose off him, pressed her hands to his chest and rode him, her face a picture of bliss as she threw her head back. He groaned and gripped her hips, moved her faster as he stared up at her, as he watched the pleasure crossing her delicate features, as he grew aware that he was the cause of it. His cock kicked inside her, eliciting another sweet moan from her, one that roused a dark need to possess her, a need he gave into. On a low growl, he twisted with her, pressed her back into the mats beside his bedding, and hooked his arm under her right knee. He captured her nipple with his lips, sucked it hard as he drove into her, as centuries of need and wicked dreams of her consumed him, shattering his control. He pushed her knee up and braced his further apart, clutched her shoulder with his free hand as he pounded into her, long hard strokes that had breathless cries leaving her lips, had her fingers tightening in his hair and holding him to her. She hooked her other leg around his hips and raised hers, and he grunted as he slid deeper still, as she took all of him into her tight heat. Kara snarled and gripped her hip, lifted it so he could remain as deep as he was now, lost in how good it felt in satisfying the tight, hot feeling that built inside him. She moaned and clawed his scalp. More! That whispered plea pushed him beyond reason. He thrust into her, driven to satisfy her now, to give her the release she needed, was asking of him. Karis arched over her, claimed her mouth, and kissed her hard as he filled her, as he mastered her body, a slave to her demand. She cried into his mouth as her entire body tensed, as she broke apart and shook in his arms, every inch of her frozen against him. He pumped harder, faster, hungry to find his own release rising as she milked him, as her core quivered and pulsed around him, demanding he surrender his seed to it. His release hit him as she tightened around him, 
struck him hard and fast, had his breath leaving him on a grunt as he sank his throbbing length into her and seed boiled up his cock. He pressed it deep into her, held her on it as it spilled from him, the possessive side of him demanding he mark her with it, ensured that she was his. He wasn't sure how long he held her like that, lost awareness of the world as bliss washed over him, as the dark need to possess her finally released him. He sank against her, still breathing hard, entire body quaking from the force of his release. He sagged into her, boneless and weak. She wrapped her arms around him and held him, her soft breath skating across his ear, her heat still encasing him. Her lips brushed his cheek and he shifted to meet them with his, kissed her long and slow, savoring the warmth that built inside him. Her lips danced across his, gentle and soft, and he rolled onto his side and brought her with him, kept kissing her as he held her close. Her legs tangled with his, and God's it felt right to hold her like this, to feel her bare curves against him, her lips on his. He drifted with her in that kiss, losing track of time. Nothing could spoil this moment. He stiffened as his gut swirled and awareness arced down his spine, his senses blaring a warning shot to his feet and stretched those senses outwards, his heart hammering as his power rose and shadows in the corners of the room shifted restlessly in response. Enya was quick to join him, adopting a warrior's stance as she looked around the room. What's wrong? The ground beneath their feet bucked and she staggered towards him. He caught her, growled. Demons, 